welcome back to my channel. So it's been a while. I've been gone for what feels to me like a very long time, even though I think it's only been like a week and a half, but I got a lot of work done. I've been working on this case very, very hard in the time I've been away, so I hope that you guys enjoy it. Before we get started, I'd like to talk about our sponsor for this video. Sponsors to this channel are so incredibly important because of the the nature of the things we talk about, we're so often demonetized here. So it gets a little tough, not only to keep the lights on, but also just to make sure that the content we're making, which is important and should be talked about to raise awareness for families of victims and the victims themselves, that's often not shared or recommended on YouTube. So what I really would ask you to do is just respect and listen to the sponsorship if you could, and also share the video. So the sponsor for today's video is Magellan TV. And let me tell you a story, three days ago, we had just gotten home from our little trip and I was trying to find something true crime related to watch on, on TV or Netflix or Hulu. And I was scrolling through and I was frustrated because I was like, I've watched everything. There's nothing new out. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I completely forgot about Magellan TV, which has tons of documentaries and docu-series that I haven't watched yet. So I get really excited. I got into Magellan TV and I started watching this awesome documentary style movie about Jack the Ripper. Magellan TV is a new type of documentary streaming membership. You can watch it anytime, anywhere, on your TV, your laptop, your phone. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and you can even cast it from your phone to your TV. The documentaries are streamed without any ads, and there's a wide selection of programs that are actually available in 4K without any additional cost. There's over 1,500 documentaries available, and new ones are being added all the time. So you're never going to run out of stuff to watch that's relevant to things you're interested in. Being a lifelong learner myself, I love documentaries. I love watching documentaries about topics I'm already familiar with. I love watching documentaries about new topics that I want to learn more about. So Magellan TV has been a really great addition to my life. Today, the first 100 viewers who head over to Magellan TV using the link in my description box will get their first month's free trial free. There's no contracts, you're not tied into anything, no strings attached. You can cancel after your first month's free trial if you want to, but I don't think that you will. I also wanna give a shout out to some of my August Patreons who celebrated their birthday in the month of August. Glenn celebrated their birthday on August 3rd. Misty Overbay celebrated her birthday on August 10th. Jennifer Stevens, who I shouted out in the last video, I did birthday Patreon shoutouts for. She was an August 2nd birthday, but she also got engaged this month. So let's all send her a big congratulations. I love celebrating things and an engagement is definitely something to celebrate. Patrizia Avola celebrated her birthday on the 16th. Lacey York celebrated her birthday on the 17th. Anna Rositia Del Val and probably Kathy Kay celebrated their birthday on the 18th. Aaron Graham's birthday was on the 19th. On August 22nd, Sasha Holland and Kay Van Sarah celebrated their birthday. Darcy Maschus celebrated her birthday on the 23rd. Jody celebrated her birthday on the 24th. Stacey Davis celebrated her birthday on the 25th. Hannah Steyer celebrated her birthday on the 26th. Leha Pupitas is going to celebrate her birthday on the 28th, so in a couple of days. It's also my son Aiden's birthday. He's going to be 8th, so happy birthday. Talia Ortiz is going to celebrate her birthday on the 29th. And Danielle Ravon is going to celebrate her birthday on the 30th. A lot of August Patreons, guys. That's amazing. Happy birthday to you all. I have a special place in my heart for August birthdays. What I used in my research process for this case were two books, and also, obviously, multiple online sources, the New York Times, the Cape Cod Times, I think it's called. Many newspapers covered this case. There was also a podcast that I listened to called Murder on the Cape, although I wasn't a huge fan. If you're interested in my sources or the books I used, they are going to be in the description box. Mainly, the book I used for this video, this first part, was called Invisible Eden, a story of love and murder on Cape Cod, and it's by Maria Fluke. 
Um, this book was written in a very creative writing style, so actually very entertaining. It was an incredibly good read, and it gave me a lot of insight into Krista's background. If you're interested, I'll put it in the description box. The other book that I used was called A Reasonable Doubt, and it's by Peter Manso. Now, both of these authors are from the area, so they're very familiar with the area. Uh, they have two very different point of views, though. I'll just say that. Now this case is going to probably be in two or three parts. I did contact the Massachusetts State Police because I wanted some clarification on certain facts and certain pieces of the puzzle that I just wanted to clear up and fact check before I put them in my video. So hopefully I will be hearing back from them today or tomorrow and then I can complete the rest of my research for the next part or two parts. Today we're talking about the murder of Krista Worthington. There is a little bit of mystique and mystery surrounding her death. There's a man who's serving a life sentence for her murder, but there's a lot of controversy as to whether or not he actually committed the murder or if there was actually enough evidence to put him in prison for it. And we're gonna get to all of that, but let me tell you first, while I was in Cape Cod with my family on our little trip, I stopped in at the town where Krista was from. I stopped in at the home that she lived in and lost her life in. And it made me really get a sense of walking in her shoes. And I think Krista Worthington is a woman that a lot of us will be able to relate to. And amongst the many good and important reasons of why this case should be talked about and remembered, the fact that Krista was very human and very relatable is among them. On January 6th, 2002, the body of 45-year-old Krista Worthington was found in her Cape Cod bungalow. She had been murdered, and it seemed like the only witness was her two-year-old daughter, Ava. What followed was a mystery that shook the small town she lived in, and a trial that would become known as the trial of the century in these parts. The details and the cast of characters in this case could have been ripped right from the pages of a John Grisham novel. In a town where everyone knew everyone, and everyone knew everyone's business, you are bound to find entanglements and scandals behind every door, but a violent murder such as this one, it was essentially unheard of. Krista's murder was the first in 30 years. Krista's story revolves around the basics, money, power, sex, but it's also a story of a truly remarkable woman, a woman who was self-motivated to raise to great heights in her career, and a woman who kind of bought into the myth that so many women are told. You can have it all, the high-powered career, the perfect family. In these modern times, women shouldn't be limited to having only one or the other. And to a degree, that is true. But being only one person with so many hours in a day and so many years in a lifetime, it's always going to be a balancing act and you're always going to feel like you're taking away from one to give to the other. As women who want to grow their careers, and be mothers and wives at the same time, we're always going to feel guilty. We're always gonna feel like we're not doing something well enough. We can't give 100% of ourselves to our jobs. We can't give 100% of ourselves to our family. And often that causes a split and a rift in you that can be frustrating. Oftentimes women will spend years focusing on getting their education and building their career only to stop one day, look around and feel that they may have missed the boat on starting a family. On the other hand, those who focus first on having and raising children may find themselves looking around one day when the children are grown enough to take care of themselves and wonder if they've missed the boat on getting into the workforce. We are always choosing, always sacrificing, always juggling. So let's remember that and try to remember not to judge Krista Worthington too harshly, especially if you're a woman, especially if you have felt similar things, because in my opinion, Krista has been judged plenty. And as always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. Krista Worthington was born on December 23rd, 1956, and she grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts. Hingham is a town in the greater Boston area, in northern Plymouth County on Boston Harbor. Her family life was not always the best. Her father, Christopher Toppy Worthington, was a Harvard-educated lawyer who had worked at the Attorney General's office as a state's prosecutor in Boston. Her mother, Gloria, worked as a portrait artist in Hingham and was of Italian descent. Gloria never felt as if she quite fit in with her husband's upper-crust New England family. 
The Worthingtons had a long history in Massachusetts. Robert and Velmiette Worthington settled in Cape Cod in 1905, and their son, John Pop Worthington, became a very important figure in the community of Truro, Massachusetts, in Cape Cod. He was a veteran of both world wars, and when he returned to his hometown in 1934, he brought jobs to the community when he reopened a fish processing plant in North Truro. He was a town selectman, which just means he was on the government board of the town, and was one of the original advocates for the Cape Cod National Seashore, a system that would end up turning 43,000 acres of ponds, woods, and beachfront into protected areas. Pop would end up making a pretty penny and gaining quite a bit of land and property. And the way he did this was by offering loans to his neighbors who could not afford to pay their property taxes. When these people would not be able to pay the loans, the deeds to their homes and lands would default to him. Although this may seem like a little bit of a sketchy way to make your money, Pop Worthington seemed to be highly respected and liked by his peers and his community. Even though he held political office and he was wealthy, he wouldn't hesitate to invite anyone in to watch a ball game and have a beer, so he was basically described as just a regular, normal guy. His wife, Ada Tiny Worthington, was given her nickname because of her tall height. She was almost six feet tall. She was born in England and she was an entrepreneur in her own right. She made a business out of using fish nets to create fashion accessories, and her designs were sold in Bergdorf's and featured on the pages of Mademoiselle and Vogue. So it's no surprise that the subsequent Worthingtons viewed themselves almost as royalty, akin to the Kennedys. Their forefathers had helped form their hometown of Truro, and Gloria, she just didn't fit in, no matter how hard she tried. She changed her maiden name from Santa Sosa to Sanders to appear to be more American. She got a nose job to appear more refined. But the general consensus was that Toppy had married Gloria simply because she'd become pregnant with their only child, Krista, and people just thought he married beneath his class and that he'd settled. Toppy was not a big help in making his wife feel as if she was enough. He had multiple affairs, and once when Krista was in high school, Gloria found a picture of one of Toppy's girlfriends hidden between the credit cards in his wallet. And Toppy was known for having one too many, which caused Gloria and Krista to keep their distance when he was home. If he was in one of his states, he would just order them around, make them feel stupid, make them feel lazy, make them feel useless, just verbally berate them. As a result of her father's heavy drinking, Krista never really touched the stuff, and later on in life, she would become part of an al group, which is basically an AA group for the family members of alcoholics and addicts. Krista was kept busy with piano lessons and ballet, but she also had some incidences of shoplifting in her teenage years, small things like costume jewelry and clothes. Her life at home wasn't really a happy one. Her parents were married legally, but they lived two separate lives that they didn't really share with each other. Toppy made a point to be home as little as possible. If he wasn't at work, he was with one of his affairs. If he wasn't with one of his affairs, he was taking his bicycle out for these extended, extremely long rides. Both Gloria and Toppy have been described as socially awkward and odd in their own different ways. Krista really didn't like to bring friends home. She was embarrassed by the palpable tension there and the abnormal dynamic that existed. Krista and her family often spent summers in Truro, a town at the tip of Cape Cod where her father's family still lived. And even though in her adult life she would travel the world, I think the area held some happy memories for her since later in life she would return like a moth to the flame. However, a friend of Krista's, who would sometimes go with her to Truro on weekends in the summer, stated that the Truro Worthingtons never fully accepted Krista and treated her as an outsider, most likely viewing her as an extension of her mother, a woman they did not accept as a true Worthington. The exception to this was Krista's grandparents, Pop and Tiny, whom she could truly be herself around. She loved them fiercely and was proud of their accomplishments. In high school, Krista was well-liked. She was a cheerleader, she was part of the school's literary magazine, she had a wide circle of friends. She was voted most popular in her senior class and the words best smile sat by her yearbook picture. But the girl with that winning smile, she was experiencing some personal struggles in her senior year. She had gotten pregnant by her high school boyfriend, John, and they had to make the tough decision 
to come to terms with the fact that they felt they were too young to be bringing a child into the world. After high school, Krista enrolled at Vassar College, a private liberal arts university in Poughkeepsie, New York. Vassar also has a long and colorful history, known as one of the Seven Sisters, the first elite colleges for women in the United States. Between the years of 1861 and 1969, it had been a girls-only college, but shortly before Krista attended, it became co-ed. Her classmates remember her as this tiny figure, walking briskly through the campus, wearing the long skirts common in the 70s, and carrying a stack of books almost as big as she was. Academically, she excelled. As an English major, she was considered by her professors to be incredibly insightful and astute. She loved to read and was an elegant writer. She loved to write and had a perfectionist quality about her work. On top of being smart, she was a beautiful woman. Described as pretty and petite, she had thick chestnut hair, porcelain skin, and intelligent dark eyes that would flash between amusement, anger, and melancholy. She was a complex person internally. She sought out emotional and physical connections, but still kept almost everyone she allowed into her life at a safe distance. College was a little bit of a challenge for Krista, however. In high school, things had come easily to her. Friends, popularity, boys. But college was a little bit of a different story. Vassar was a whole new world, and she would spend the majority of her first year at college hidden away in her dorm room. She had managed to finagle getting a single dorm room in her freshman year, which if you've gone to college, you know that's pretty much almost impossible. But she had told the college that she had some medical issues, she would have incredibly hard menstrual periods, so she'd have to have a single room in order to kind of be alone while that was going on and not disturb a roommate. Her anxiety about things like tests and deadlines on papers would cause her to put off getting things done until the very last moment. So she'd procrastinate on studying or writing the paper until the very last moment and then she'd get her hands on some uppers and stay up all night. And that's so similar to my own college years, you know, minus the Adderall. I was such a big procrastinator. You almost have so much to do and it stresses you out so much that you do nothing until the very last minute when you don't have a choice. But that's what she would do. And a college friend of hers said that Krista could get something done in 10 hours that it would take everybody else two weeks to do. The next day she would be so exhausted and spent that she'd lock herself in her room and not get out of bed all day. The girl who had been voted most popular in high school was now serious and quiet in her college classes. Fellow students would say they knew her, they knew she'd been there, but they couldn't really tell you much about her. She was withdrawing inside of herself, keeping her life and her thoughts private and beginning to build a wall around herself that few people would ever get around. Sure, she had relationships with men, but they were intense and passionate and they fizzled out as quickly as they'd fired up. The boys she dated in college had the same kind of observations about her. There was something sad about her. She was strong, but she was damaged. She had grown up in a house where there was a constant cloud of scrutiny and judgment, and she exercised these same practices in her own relationships. It seemed like no one man could live up to her standards for very long, and she wasn't really willing to bend on what her standards were or what she expected from somebody. Her kind of outlook makes it very easy to fall in love because you're searching for that perfect someone who's going to make you feel whole again, but that outlook also makes it almost impossible to stay in love because nobody's ever going to meet the standards that you set up. A male classmate of hers who was a freshman when she was a senior said he had developed quite a bit of a crush on her, but she had a steady stream of male admirers. Most of them were older men who'd already graduated and just came back to the campus to visit her and bring her little gifts. She graduated with honors and moved to Manhattan in the summer of 1977. She tried to get work writing, but ended up taking a paralegal job. The way she fell into fashion writing was by chance. In 1979, she took a job as the assistant to the beauty editor of Cosmopolitan, Malin DeSantis. But Krista had never been into fashion, and while most of her coworkers were excited to have landed a job at Cosmo, Krista didn't take it very seriously, considering the whole industry to be shallow. She wrote some columns for the magazine, and even though they were on topics that she wasn't very interested in, her perfectionist and passionate nature showed in whatever she produced. While she spent her time grabbing coffees and writing when she could, she met another magazine editor, Jane Lane, who thought that Krista should apply for a position at the magazine Women's Wear Daily. Here, as the accessories editor, 
Krista would have more opportunity to write. She also acquired a mentor while at Women's Wear Daily, a man named John Fairchild, who was the editor-in-chief and would go on to found the magazine W. He liked her, saw promise in her, and taught her about the business and how she could be successful in it. Krista was suddenly launched into the world of high fashion, a world she wasn't ready for and definitely didn't take to at first. She went from a simple college girl in a small college in a small upstate New York town to a 20-something living in Manhattan surrounded by all these important people in the fashion and publishing worlds. Imagine the character Andy in The Devil Wears Prada. Plain Jane, serious writer, ends up rising in the ranks of the most elite fashion magazine in the world and transforming externally and internally. Krista was no plain Jane, and neither is Anne Hathaway, let's be honest. But the point is, she was not image obsessed. She wore her hair loose, she rarely wore makeup, and she bought her clothes at thrift shops. Suddenly, she was surrounded by people who considered image to be highly important. And of course, she would have felt the pressure to fit in, to at least look as if she belonged, to transform externally and internally. But she took whatever she wrote seriously, even if it was just about scarves or shoes. When other writers would be content to do the bare minimum, just get the piece put out, she would do this huge and deep research into the background and the history of this certain scarf or the material that the scarf was made out of and what country it came from and all of this beautiful and intense research in order to paint a picture of this simple accessory. So even though she didn't take clothes and fashion all that seriously, she took herself seriously and she took the, the product that she put out very seriously. In 1981, Toppy Worthington gave his daughter $40,000 for an apartment in Gramercy Park and she filled it with books, odds and ends, and pictures of her grandparents, the best parts of her. This small but cozy apartment would become her home for the next 15 years. In 1983, Women's Wear Daily sent her to Paris to act as the fashion editor for Women's Wear Daily and W Magazines. You can see how quickly she made a name for herself, even though it wasn't her passion. Her work ethic and attention to detail made her stand out enough to garner her an impressive promotion within four years. In Paris, she found herself in the front row of fashion shows right next to John Fairchild, an invited guest to high society parties and private meetings with big name designers. She spent afternoons with Stang and Yves Saint Laurent, but at her place of work, she found that the French branch of the magazine had not yet jumped on board the feminist movement that had begun in the States. Krista called it a boys club, and her supervising editors, who were men, were not the most respectful to women, to say the least. Her parents thought different things about Krista's success in the fashion world. Toppy thought it was nonsense, obviously, but Gloria brimmed with pride. Every time she would talk to a friend about her daughter, the fashion writer, and she'd always make sure that she'd have a magazine in her bag that she could pull out and show everyone that Krista had written it, and there was her name. Gloria visited Krista in Paris, and there's a little story from the book that I read, Invisible Eden, that I wanted to share with you because I think it illustrates very well who Krista was and who her mother was too. While Krista showed her mother around the city, she was wearing a flea market skirt that had seen better days and an inside out sweatshirt she'd bought at the Wellfleet flea market in Cape Cod. Her mother asked her why she was dressed like a rag doll when she was in Paris. Krista really just liked comfortable clothes, and when she was sent to an event that called for a more black tie attire, she would borrow a gown or an outfit from the magazine, but she knew who she was and what she felt comfortable in, and her new surroundings were not going to change her. And even though she often dressed in these less than fashionable clothes, somehow she managed to pull it off and almost make it look as if it was a fashion statement. Krista dressed in the clothes version of the messy bun, because let's be honest, ladies, sometimes perfecting the perfect messy bun and getting it to look just the right amount of messy without looking like you just woke up, sometimes that can be harder than like doing a complicated updo. You know it's true. It was also in Paris that she purchased this huge ornate mirror that she would fall in love with on site, and this mirror would travel all over the world with her eventually ending up in the Cape Cod bungalow that she would live her last days in. As time passed in France, she was still looking for that love connection that would check all her boxes. She told a friend, I'm looking for a wasp with a sail bag. A well put together man who came from a good family but also wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. Basically the perfect man, right? The best of both worlds. Like when men say they want a lady in the streets but a freak in the sheets, that's what it reminds me of. 
but that kind of man is not easy to find, so she filled her time in Paris with trysts and affairs with married men. Some that were close to her would say she'd get involved with these types of men on purpose because they were unavailable. The fact that the relationship could never get too serious would save her from having to get too close. From being disappointed or being disappointing. Personally, I'm not so sure. I don't know if she actually sought out relationships with men who were married or otherwise unavailable. I think she just had attractions and immediate connections with certain people. And she was impulsive. She didn't think about tomorrow. She thought about that moment, what feels good right now. She was also attracted to dark and tortured types who carried a lot of emotional baggage. An artist who was emotionally stunted or a handsome English actor who had a drinking problem. That actor ended up being one of her longest relationships, lasting a little bit over a year as she read books about how to cope with being in a relationship with an alcoholic. Sometimes we're attracted to people who are like our parents, even if we don't have a good relationship with said parent. In 1987, Krista was given the position of acting bureau chief at Women's Wear Daily when the person who had previously done that job moved on. She was livid when she found out she was only temporarily filling in until they found someone else. Even though she was more qualified, they brought in a man from M Magazine, a man who worked in advertising and promotions to take the job from her. She was basically given a thanks for helping out, now back to your desk, pat on the back. She made the decision that her time at Women's Wear Daily had come to an end. She really liked Paris and she enjoyed her time there. Later on, she would even consider moving with her daughter there. She wanted Ava to be bilingual, to speak English and French, and she would play Ava these French-speaking cartoons in order for Ava to learn the language, which she was by the time she was two. After Paris, she moved to London, where she did some freelance writing using the connections she'd made while working in Paris for Women's Wear Daily. But she had this constant indecision. She liked Europe a lot, but she missed home. When she was in the States, she'd constantly reminisce about her time in Paris and London. She could never make up her mind about where she wanted to be or what she thought was home to her. In 1999, she shipped the mirror that she had brought from Paris to London back to her Gramercy Park apartment. And soon after, she followed. She worked for Elle magazine on Fifth Avenue, a magazine run by three women. Once back in New York, she began dating Leopold Stanislaus Stakowski. We will just call him Stan. Now Stan has a colorful and interesting family as well. He is the oldest son of world-renowned conductor Leopold Stokowski and Gloria Vanderbilt, who inherited her father's millions when she was just 15 months old. The Vanderbilts are obviously a big deal, especially in New York City. Stan is also older half-brother to Anderson Cooper. Gloria Vanderbilt's father, Cornelius, was a railroad tycoon, and he made his fortune investing in the railroad industry as it became a booming business. If you have ever seen the series The Men Who Built America, which if you haven't, you really should, Vanderbilt is featured in the series with well-known names such as Carnegie, Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan. He was considered to be one of the wealthiest men in America, so, like I said, they're kind of a big deal. Many leather-bound books and their apartments smell of rich mahogany. Do you know who I am? I'm kind of a big deal. I'm very important. Uh, I have many leather-bound books and my apartment smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> Krista saw that Stan struggled with some of the same issues that she did. His father had been an alcoholic who drank himself to death. He came from a family with high pressure and high expectations. She related to him on that, and she was also drawn to the power and notoriety that his family held. He was handsome, rich, and influential, and on top of that, he built boats with his own hands. He was a wasp with a sail bag. She created this storybook romance with Stan in her head. What better way to show the snobby Massachusetts Worthingtons that she truly was one of them than to show up with a Vanderbilt on her arm? But Stan Sikowski, he was not looking to settle down. He had just gotten out of a relationship and he was keeping his options open. I do think that Krista was hoping he would be the one, but it turned out he didn't have similar feelings about her. And I really think that it damaged her self-worth and brought back old feelings of insecurities about not being good enough. Not being good enough for her father or his family or the magazine that had used her as a placeholder before giving the job to somebody else. 
After facing this romantic disappointment, Krista pretty much just existed professionally. She continued taking work and doing her assignments, but it didn't seem as if she was striving for anything more in her career at that time. She worked for J. Crew for a little bit and she interviewed for the New York Times, but she was 40 years old at this point. And the energy and the drive of her youth had been replaced by a feeling that she had missed out on something. She talked about writing a novel. Her friends encouraged her to do so. She was a good writer, but she never seemed to be able to settle in and just do it. One word to describe Krista Worthington at this time would be discontent. She took up with a magician who went by the stage name The Amazing Tarquin. They didn't have much in common, but Krista seemed incredibly attracted to him. She said he was very handsome. Troubles in their relationship began when the amazing Tarquin caught on that Krista might be trying to get pregnant by him. She had come down with that baby fever, and the amazing Tarquin told her he wasn't interested in becoming a father again. He already had a child in New Hampshire. She told him she wouldn't expect anything from him. She would raise the child on her own but it got too heavy and the magician, he did a disappearing act. At some point, Krista realized if she wanted to have a child, she would have to do it on her own. As she began looking into sperm donors, she wrote an article in Harper's Bazaar that reflected her state of mind at this time. In it, she says, at the far end of my childbearing years, the feminist banner I waved in the 70s is painted very different colors. Krista became a part of a group called Single Mothers by Choice. Some of the group meetings were attended by women who had already made the decision to have a child and raise this child on their own. Some of the women who attended these meetings were just testing the waters to see if it was a decision they wanted to make. Krista fell in that latter group. She listened, she watched, she took it all in, and she actually went on the Lisa Gibbons talk show as a representative of this group to share her feelings and the experiences of her and the other women in their constant battle of wondering if this was the right decision and if it was something they should be doing. Instead of her openness and vulnerability being applauded or accepted by the audience of the Lisa Gibbons talk show, they booed and hissed at her. They pretty much let her know with their reaction that they thought she was being selfish and that this was a bad idea, which absolutely blows my mind. I mean, it's 2019 now, this was a different time, but it wasn't that long ago. No person who is being openly and humanly vulnerable should be booed by other humans for a personal choice. A personal choice that involves bringing another person into the world to love and care for. It's just ridiculous and I feel terrible for her. As she was perusing folders of potential donors, looking at pictures and even listening to recordings of their voices, she visited the doctor and was told that she might be premenopausal and it wasn't looking good for her chances of becoming pregnant. This was obviously a devastating blow to her. She called friends who could hear the tears in her voice. She just needed someone to listen and to understand. And while she was dealing with these very personal and hard issues, her mother Gloria fell ill. It was colon cancer and Krista knew that Gloria needed someone to take care of her, something that her husband Toppy was not doing. In the summer of 1997, Krista packed up her Gramercy Park apartment, including that mirror she purchased in Paris, and she moved back home to Cape Cod, to Truro, the town of her childhood summers. Cape Cod is truly a place unlike any other. It's a popular vacation spot because of its quaint character, delicious lobster rolls, and gorgeous scenery. When my husband and I started dating, I began going with his family to the Cape. It was a tradition for them, and it became a very special place for me. The Cape is often associated with the Kennedys, who have a compound on Hyannis Port, where JFK would run the country from during the summers of his presidency. The place is full of history. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, something interesting and something important happened there. If you had been under the impression that the Pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, you would be wrong. They first set foot on U.S. soil in Cape Cod the part that is today known as Provincetown. The Pilgrims were a group of people fleeing England and seeking religious freedom in the New World. They were headed for Virginia, but it was November, and the Cape is known for its extremely rough weather conditions in the winter. Intense cold and winds caused the Mayflower to dock in the harbor at Cape Cod five weeks before they moved on to Plymouth Rock, and it was here they drafted and signed the document that would determine how they wanted to be governed a document that is now known as the Mayflower Compact. 
It was created on November 11, 1620, and signed by 41 of the ship's passengers, men only, of course. When you drive up to Provincetown, you'll notice a striking structure that towers over the town. It stands 252 feet tall atop the 100-foot-high Pole Hill, bringing the all-granite structure to a grand total of 350 feet. The tower is called Pilgrim Monument, and if you choose to climb the 116 steps inside, you will be treated to some of the best views of Cape Cod. If you look on a map, Cape Cod stretches off of mainland Massachusetts like a flexed arm, with Provincetown right at the tip and Truro next to it. After the Pilgrims landed, Miles Standish and William Bradford led a group of 16 men into Truro. They were short on food, and it was their job to scope things out and find some. Pilgrim Pond in Truro was where this group had their first drink of fresh water in the New World. And on November 16th, in true settler fashion, the men came upon a stash of corn that had been put there by the native tribe, which they then stole to bring back to their people. Today, that area is called Corn Hill. After having a run-in with some of the natives on what is now called First Encounter Beach, the pilgrims decided to move on. The tribe had already had experiences with previous European settlers, and they were not good ones, so they weren't receptive or friendly to see these new white faces once again invading their territory. Realizing they weren't welcome, the Mayflower sailed on to Plymouth Rock, and the rest is history if you believe what you've been told about history. I think it's funny because online it says the pilgrims deemed the area unsuitable. So they were like, oh, this Provincetown and Tro area, this Cape Cod area, it's not gonna work for us, you know, so we're gonna move on. But really they were shown the door. Now, Truro is a small town. You might drive through it on your way to the hustle and bustle of Provincetown and completely miss it. It's nestled between Wellfeet and Provincetown and holds a remote wilderness appeal. The main part of town called North Truro has one stoplight and a few general stores, maybe a diner here or there. Driving down Route 6, you see trees and more trees. It's very beautiful in the summer, green and lush, but you will find yourself wondering, where do all the people live? Their houses are hidden with long clamshell driveways leading up to gorgeous seaside cottages and bungalows overlooking the expanse of beaches in the Atlantic Ocean. Less than 2,000 people live here year-round, but in the summer months, the population can swell to 30,000, and it is in those months that the permanent residents of Truro and most of the Cape make their money. When everyone else is on vacation, the community works. Most of Cape Cod closes down between the months of January and April. The tourists leave, the snowbirds fly to warmer climates, but the people who stay, this is their time to relax. This is their vacation. They read, paint, and spend time on their hobbies and interests. They don't always get much snow, but it gets bitter cold, and the wind coming off the ocean is cutting. Truro is small, off the map, but that is the appeal to most of the people who make their homes there. They're escaping from the busy world. Krista was escaping from something as well. When she arrived, she took up residence in her grandmother's cottage on Pamet Harbor, which was nicknamed Tiny's Hut. Here, she would meet a man who would become very important to her, and very important later, in her murder investigation. His name was Tony Jacket. Tony was the shellfish constable for Provincetown. As shellfish constable, Tony was responsible for making sure anyone who was out digging for clams had the proper license, and he could sell them one if they needed. He would also regularly test the water quality. The harbor master's office was basically right across the street from Tiny's hut, and Krista made a point of walking over there often to complain about all the disturbances she encountered living in the harbor. The fishermen in the morning were too noisy. She didn't like the porta potties that were set up by her house. The parking lot next door to her often ran out of space and people would park their boats in front of her house. While she was there, Tony Jacket would sometimes also be there and the two developed an instantaneous attraction to each other. He was in his 50s, but still a very handsome man. He had thick, curly black hair, a perpetual five o'clock shadow, and a year-round golden tan partly because of his time spent outdoors and partly due to his Portuguese ancestry. He was also open and friendly. He had a youthful energy about him. The only problem was Tony was a married man with six children. Tony and his wife Susan had both been students at Provincetown High School, but their relationship didn't start in high school. Tony was a basketball star and Susan gained and held onto the indisputed title of the most beautiful girl to ever graduate from Provincetown High School. 
but she was four years older than Tony, and they didn't have a lot of interaction besides for the fact that Susan's younger sister was a cheerleader for the basketball team that Tony was on. Susan got married to somebody else and settled in to become a wife and a mother only to be devastated when she and her husband found out that he couldn't have children. So the couple adopted two Sioux Indian babies, Kim and Shelby, but the marriage ended soon after that and Susan was left alone to care for two young children. One day, Susan and her mother were at Susan's aunt's house when her mother spotted Tony outside on the street. He lived nearby and Susan's mother invited him in for a cup of coffee. At first, Susan thought that he was too young for her. He was 21 and she was 25, but he was charming and devastatingly handsome and she found herself falling for him. He began visiting her regularly, playing with her two kids, and within no time, they were pregnant with a child of their own, a daughter that they would name Bronwyn. They got married and had three more children, bringing their little pack to a total of six. Tony came from a long line of fishermen. His father was the captain of the Plymouth Bell, part of the Provincetown fleet. And Tony worked with him on his boat for a little while, but the two began to butt heads until finally Tony decided it was probably a good time to strike out on his own. He refinanced their house and purchased the Josephine J his pride and joy, and a vessel that he called the perfect little big boat. But there are many reasons why Tony Jacket would not be your typical family man. All of us have two sides to us. One side of Tony was devoted husband, loving father, hardworking fisherman, but he had a little bit of a troubled past and he ran into issues early on, long before he met Krista Worthington. In 1984, business was not booming and Tony was having a hard time making the mortgage payments. He was approached by a couple of guys in business suits who asked him if he'd be interested in captaining a boat for them from Columbia to Boston Harbor. For his trouble, he would receive $2 million. What was the catch? The boat would be carrying 40,000 pounds of some green stuff, illegal green stuff. Initially, he said no. But as he thought about it and that two million dollars floated through his head, he started to think that the benefit might outweigh the risk. He went back and he was like, okay, I changed my mind, I'll do it. But by that time, they'd moved on. It's a business, it's a booming business, and they couldn't wait around for Tony. They'd chosen somebody else to captain their boat, Tony's friend, another fisherman named Skip Albanese. The men said he could still help out, and he was given the task of finding a safe spot to dock on the Neoponset River right outside of Boston. The river was kind of a favorite of smugglers and participators in illegal activities, and still is today. Last year, the state made a decision to start cleaning it up. It's terribly polluted, and there's an area on the river that has been referred to as Balder's Burial Ground, referring to crime boss Whitey Balder, and the fact that he has buried several of his victims there. Okay, so Skip Albanese is driving this boat full of drugs back to Massachusetts from Columbia, but he finds out that there's a big Coast Guard presence in Boston Harbor at that point, so he didn't know what to do. So he did the only thing he could think of, which was to bring the boat home to Provincetown. Under the cover of dark, Tony helped Skip and the crew unload some of the cargo, about 40 bales. But they made the decision that this was too risky and they should just sink the boat. Once the heat had died down, they could just return and dive to the sunken boat, and grab off the rest of the cargo and dry it out and then hand it over to their bosses. I feel like there were so many other plans, like sinking the boat should have been on the low end of backup plans, but th that's what they did or tried to do. Unfortunately for them, the fuel tank was empty, so the boat, the boat didn't sink. Obviously, at first, they didn't know that the boat didn't sink. They just sabotaged it and then, you know, walked away, patting each other on the back for a job well done. But within no time, that half-submerged boat was spotted, and the authorities and DEA, they were all over it. Tony Jacket became a state's witness, so essentially, he, he threw everybody else under the bus. And in return, he got no jail time, but his problems were not over. He wasn't able to make his mortgage payments, so they lost their house. And in 1996, after repeatedly running into some bad weather, his pride and joy, the Josephine G, it sank. That's pretty much when he took the job as shellfish constable and part-time harbor master. So when he ran into Krista the year after, he was at a strange place in his life, a crossroads, sort of. He didn't have his boat anymore, 
He'd been on that boat as a fisherman for, you know, as long as he could remember. And now he was trying to redefine himself as something else. And Krista was completely different than any woman he'd ever met. She was smart and independent. She had a sassy mouth on her. Uh, she, she amused him and probably made him feel alive and young again. And some stories of Tony and Krista's relationship will paint Krista as the seductress, drawing the married man into her web. But long before Krista came on the scene, Tony Jacket was a well-known ladies' man, a huge flirt, and he'd had other affairs before he met her. And I think Krista started spending a lot more time in the harbor master's office because of Tony. She'd find things to complain about, so she could go over and talk to the harbor master, hoping that Tony Jacket would make an appearance. Deep down, Krista, although independent, although keeping everyone at arm's length, she was lonely. Her mother was sick, her father was MIA, the Truro Worthingtons were icy to her at best. Gloria and Toppy's marriage at this point was pretty much non-existent. Even though she was, she was dying, he still could not bring himself to care for his wife and be by her side. Gloria told Krista, your father's always out riding his bike from sun up to sundown. And he started buying all these shoes. And she brought Krista over to Toppy's closet and opened it up. And was like, look at all these shoes, boxes and boxes of shoes. What's he going to do with all of those shoes? The reality was that Toppy had begun a relationship with a woman who was almost 50 years younger than himself. Her name was Elizabeth Porter, and she worked at, you guessed it, a shoe store. We're going to talk about Elizabeth Porter in a minute. Yes, we are. When the summer season ended and the tourists left, Krista moved out of Tiny's Hut and she moved into a bungalow on 50 Depot Road. This was the house that she had spent her summers in with her family. This was the house she'd always intended to live in when she moved back to the Cape, but for the season it had been rented out to visitors, so she had to wait for them to leave. But when Tony stopped seeing Krista at the harbor master's office, he asked, where's my little hippie? Seeing her, chatting with her, listening to her bougie rants, he'd grown accustomed to it. It'd become part of his routine, and when it was gone, he missed it. He missed her. When the harbor master told him where Krista had gone, Tony got himself a pair of rollerblades. He began going every day to the Boston Beach parking lot and rollerblading there, knowing that Krista went to that beach and she would probably see him. And she did see him. She told him that a grown man wearing rollerblades looked silly, but that was her way. She was upfront and honest. At times, she could be abrasive, but Tony wasn't put off. He wasn't deterred. And after seeing him a couple of times, showing off his blades of glory in that parking lot, Krista invited him up to her house for tea. While I was in Truro, I visited Krista's house. It's almost like a hidden castle in a fairy tale. Depot Road stretches from Pamet Harbor to Truro Center Road. Many of the Truro Worthingtons live on Depot Road. So did Ben Affleck's mother, fun fact. When you're driving down Depot Road, there's a 100% chance you will miss Krista's driveway, especially in the summer, because it's camouflaged amongst the lush foliage. When you do find it, after turning around because you missed it the first time, you'll drive up the standard clamshell driveway through a dense forest-like atmosphere, and if you pay close attention, you'll see the house peeking through the trees to your left, high on the hill, overlooking the town and the harbor. I needed to see the house. I needed to see the house that the woman I'd learned so much about inhabited. And I, I turned right around and I got out of there. I'm glad I went, but I would never go back. I'm sure the people who live there now want to forget that part of their home's history. Tony said that Krista knew how to keep him coming back. And I'd like to tell you that when Krista invited him into her bed, she didn't know about his wife and six children. But I don't believe that was true. Truro's a small town. Everybody knows everyone. And she would have only had to have asked one person about Tony to find out his marital status. I just chalk it up to being human, being lonely. Maybe they were both lonely. They were certainly both human. Tony said with Krista, it was a fatal attraction. She was the exact opposite of his wife. She had this wild, unkempt, bohemian style about her and she told him that they could just use each other for physical satisfaction like the Europeans did. She told him that's how they do it in Europe. He said that she never made him feel as if she was going to become too attached or become a problem for him and his marriage. He knew that she liked him a lot, he could tell, but she never begged him to stay when he had to go or professed her love for him. 
He also said that she was kind of a loner, that she liked to be alone. She didn't like people just dropping over to her house. He never worried that if he showed up, there would be somebody else there already. And that may seem like a small detail, but later on in part two of this video, it will become important. Basically, Tony thought he had found the, the perfect arrangement, right? He'd found somebody that he would have absolutely no strings with, that he could live out his maybe midlife crisis kind of fantasy with, and it wouldn't affect anything that was going on at home. It wouldn't affect his relationship with his wife or his status as his children's father. They were separate. He wasn't looking for love. He wasn't going to leave his wife. A few months after returning to the Depot Road house, Krista went back to New York City for a little while. She still had her Gramercy Park apartment and she did some freelance writing. You know, she met up with old friends, but she still drove back every weekend to see her mother and to see Tony. Once again, this is something that Krista seemed to struggle with her whole life. Whenever she was in one place, she longed for the other. When she was in Quiet Truro, she thought of her life and friends in the city. But when she was back in Manhattan, she longed for the dark, star-filled sky at the Cape. Stars that you would never see amongst the city lights of New York. Finally, in May of 1998, she made a decision. She sold her New York City apartment and moved permanently into the bungalow at the Cape. Krista and Tony did their best to be discreet, but like I said, small town. Word got around and everyone knew. Everyone except Susan, who later admitted that she was the last person to find out about her husband's affair. And some people that Krista told about the affair with Tony, they said that she was a little bit more attached to Tony Jacket than she let on. She began to realize that Tony really did love his wife, that he didn't want to leave Susan, and that Krista was just a distraction for him. He would talk about Susan and his kids when he was with Krista. He wasn't trying to be mean. I just genuinely think that he was clueless. He, he thought they were having this no-strings-attached, unemotional relationship so he could feel free to talk about things like that without having to worry about her getting jealous or possessive. For him, it was just sex. For her, it had started off that way, and he missed the part where it became more. She told Tony that a doctor told her she couldn't get pregnant, which was pretty much true. She told Tony that she was allergic to latex, which was also true. She would rash up if she touched the stuff. But do I think that Krista intentionally tried to get pregnant by Tony Jacket? Yes, I do. And not necessarily to trap him or to get him to leave his wife. He already told her that wasn't going to happen. I think she admired certain qualities about him, especially physically. She probably thought about what a child of theirs would look like. And she was ready to have a baby. She'd been trying to and looking into other alternatives for a while now. She once told a friend of hers that Tony's children were all beautiful, and they are. And Tony remembered later, looking back on his time with Krista, that after they completed the act, she wouldn't get out of bed. She'd lay in bed with her hips tilted up. And when he talked about it later, he said, now I see that she was trying to get pregnant. And if I'd been there, I would have asked him, did, did you not see that then at that point? What did you think she was doing? Tilting her hips up and laying in bed afterwards. What did, what did you think she was doing? But I think he was clueless. Her impending pregnancy should have been no surprise to him, but it was. He freaked out when Krista told him that she was pregnant. She told him to relax. She didn't want anything from him, just like she told the amazing Tarquin she was going to raise this child on her own. No one had to find out, but like I said, everybody already knew they were sleeping together. So when Krista became pregnant, it wasn't hard to put two and two together. Tony kept his affair with Krista a secret from his wife. He kept the birth of his child with Krista, a secret from his wife, for almost two years. He says it was never an option to leave Susan and the family he had with Susan to start a new family with Krista, so he didn't see why there was a point to tell her and bring that kind of trouble to his family. At first, Tony still made his visits to Krista's, but as winter came, they became less frequent. This was no longer a no-strings-attached kind of situation, no matter what they wanted to tell themselves. She was carrying his child and it was easier for Tony to put Krista, her pregnancy, and their future child in a box, lock it up tight, and put it in a place in the back of his mind where he didn't have to look at it or think about it. Krista spent that Christmas alone, and one day Tony Jacket just stopped showing up. He didn't call, he didn't answer her calls, 
and he made himself scarce around town. He wasn't hanging out at the harbor master's office anymore. If he saw her coming while they were in town together, he would run and hide. While all of this is going on, Gloria Worthington is, is getting worse. She's getting sicker. And, and Toppy, her husband, at this point, he's pretty much made his relationship with his 20-something shoe clerk public. Krista moved in with her mother. She brought her soup and water. She brushed her hair, changed her clothes, changed her sheets, and sat next to her bed while Toppy is snuck in and out of the house, oblivious and indifferent to what was going on. Tappy even sent over a real estate agent while Gloria was still alive, still sick in bed, so the real estate agent could appraise the house and put it on the market. He was selling the house basically right from underneath her while she was still alive. Krista and Gloria spent days together, side by side, laying in Gloria's bed with Gloria's hand on her daughter's stomach, hoping to feel the kick of a granddaughter she would never get to meet. Gloria passed away a week before Ava was born. A friend of Krista's, Amara Chase, held her hand while she was in labor. Amara had always been a good friend to Krista. She was a mother herself, and Krista really liked and respected her. She liked and respected her enough to eventually change her will to state that if anything were to happen to Krista, Ava would go into Amira's custody. Tony Jackett's name was not listed on the birth certificate. Under the category of father, there was no name listed. Before we go any further, let's leave Krista for a moment, holding her newborn daughter contentedly, still fresh off of losing her mother, basically the lyrics to Lightning Crashes by Live. And let's check in with good old Toppy Worthington and his special friend, Elizabeth Porter. She'll be called Beth from now on. So Gloria's gone, Toppy sells their home with a quickness. A rumor circulated saying that he left behind her ashes in an urn in the attic of the house he'd sold. He moved into a ranch home in Weymouth and he was able to have his girlfriend over as much as he wanted. She pretty much lived there because when Krista visited, she claimed she saw her stuff all over. But in fact, Beth Porter lived in a boarding house in Quincy, paid for by Toppy. When he rented the place, he told the landlord it was for his daughter and Beth Porter did bear a striking resemblance to Krista Worthington to the point where after Krista was murdered, there was rumors circulating that said maybe Beth Porter wasn't Toppy's girlfriend after all. Maybe she was his illegitimate daughter. DNA tests later would disprove that theory, which would have been a far less creepy option. Beth Porter really was Toppy's girlfriend. She was the daughter of a Boston cop who had taken a bad path in life. She worked as an escort and had become addicted to heroin. Beth had a long criminal record that seemed to start when she was 20. Since 1992, she had been convicted of drunk driving, larceny of less than $250, and various motor vehicle offenses. She had been convicted of five drug-related crimes, and on August 7th, 1998, she was arrested in a hotel room. She was also connected to another high-profile man, Dr. Dirk Grenadier. Dirk Grenadier was a well-respected doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital when he was charged with the murder of his wife, Mabel. The motive? She had found out about his secret life, which included escorts and other tawdry things. One of these escorts was Beth Porter, who testified at his trial that he had paid her for her services on at least two occasions. And you guys know what I mean when I say escorts and services, right? They, they weren't having dinner. It also turned out that Beth Porter had a boyfriend, another addict. His name was Ed Hall, and Beth Porter was HIV positive. I don't know how Tappy ended up getting involved with Beth Porter. It certainly does seem at first glance to be an unlikely pairing. He spent a lot of time in the courtroom as a lawyer. She spent a lot of time in the courtroom as the defendant. But that's not important. The important thing is Toppy Worthington was pretty much financing Beth Porter's life. Krista saw her inheritance being wasted, literally going into somebody's arm. She was worried that her father was paying for Beth's extensive medical bills. She was worried that Beth was using her father for money. And she wasn't shy to let either one of them know how she felt. Needless to say, there was no love lost between Krista and Toppy and Beth. So Ava Worthington is born. This beautiful little baby with her father's dark curly hair and olive complexion. Krista obviously fell in love with her daughter. She took great pride in bringing her around town and showing her off. Ava was all she had. They were connected forever. Ava filled all the empty places in Krista's heart and life. 
Krista was a woman who had lived all over the world, always longing to be where she wasn't at that moment. But now Ava was home and wherever she was, was where Krista would be. Tony Jacket was not as excited about the birth of his new daughter. In fact, it would be almost over a year until he would meet her in person. Having a new baby is hard. Doing it all by yourself is even more difficult. When the police arrived at Krista's house after her body was discovered, there was comments made about how messy the house was. Toys all over the living room, dishes, dirty dishes stacked in the sink, every available piece of counter space was taken out by a book or a knickknack or some kitchen appliance. Before Ava, Krista hadn't really been that much of a housekeeper. Her spaces were always tiny and cluttered, which is a sign of a creative mind, if you ask me. But after Ava, obviously it got harder to keep up on household chores. So she hired someone to help, a woman named Ellen Webb. Ellen functioned as a nanny slash housekeeper slash cook slash friend. It just made me laugh that it was the men who were being interviewed and talking about how Krista's house was found, saying that it was so messy, they couldn't believe it, being so judgmental, because have you ever walked into the college dorm room of like a 19 year old or the bachelor pad of a 20 something? If they didn't have their wives and mothers cleaning up after them, doing their laundry and bringing their dirty dishes and putting them in the dishwasher, those men wouldn't know what a clean house looked like. Even with Alan's help, it was hard for Krista to part with Eva to do even basic things like shower or wash her hair. Relatives would come over and make comments that Eva always seemed to be nursing. I think it comforted both mother and baby to be close at all times and Krista suffered from mild postpartum depression. She was always anxious, always nervous, scared that something would happen to the baby. There was just this constant feeling of paranoia and fear pressing down on her. Through Ellen Webb, Krista would meet Tim Arnold. Tim would become a suspect in her murder right along with Tony and Susan Jackets. He was the one who discovered her body. But at first he was just a date, a nice guy that Ellen thought Krista would like. Krista needed a nice guy in her life. Tony had ghosted her when she was just six months pregnant. And Tim Arnold was a nice guy and so different from Tony Jacket in looks and personality. He was tall and slender with sandy hair and light colored eyes. He was a writer and a painter and had also experienced some hard times of his own. He was a divorcee with children he barely saw. He had also suffered from a cavernous malformation of blood vessels on his spine. And after having surgery for that, he experienced double vision and issues with balance that prevented him from doing a lot of things like driving. His father, who he lived with right around the corner from Krista, had to pretty much drive him everywhere. Tim wrote and illustrated a children's book called The Winter Mittens. It's a story of a little girl who owns a pair of mittens and every time she puts them on, it snows. This excites her until she makes it snow so much that a winter blizzard rages and she can't take the mittens off. But Krista seemed to really like him. She told a friend once that Tim didn't seem to realize how handsome he was. He knew about her relationship with Tony, but Krista reassured him that he was worth 20 Tony jackets. Tim Arnold fell pretty much head over heels for Krista, and he was really good with Ava too. Ava called Tim, Tim Mom. Sometimes the three of them would go into town together, Krista and Tim walking down the street with Ava in one of those little carriers on Tim's back, and some of these times they'd see Tony Jacket, and he would see them. It was like the elephant in the room that nobody talked about. Krista was hot and cold with Tim though. It's a tale as old as time. Nice guys finish last. He said she was very critical of him, something that she had learned from her own parents. He liked to hum when he was happy or when they were walking and she'd reprimand him and say, stop humming. I don't want Ava to turn into a hummer. I think she did care for him in a way. I think that she liked that he was there for Ava. He moved in shortly after they began dating, but he would sleep in a different bedroom because Krista and Ava shared the same bed. I get the impression it wasn't a very equal relationship. It was mostly about what Krista wanted, when she wanted it. And he was so infatuated with her that for a while, he was willing to go along with whatever. Not realizing that there was some resentment building up in him. The fact that he always had to be available to her, but she was never available to him. Krista and Tim had only lived together for about six months when it began to unravel. 
They argued about everything. She criticized him about everything. And because of his health issues and his issues with balance that were getting worse, Krista was worried that he would drop Ava while he was holding her or trip and fall on top of her child. They decided they'd be better off being friends instead of romantic partners. Tim moved back in with his father, but he'd still walk through the woods to Krista's house every so often to visit with her and with Ava. But Krista made it clear one day when he showed up unexpectedly and she found him in her kitchen that he needed to call from now on. She didn't like unannounced visitors, not at all. Tim had been inside Krista's walls for a moment, but he was on the outside again now. And Krista's hope that Tony would one day call her or show up at her door and want to meet Ava and be a part of Ava's life, that hope slowly turned to anger. He was literally hiding from her. He did everything to avoid her, to avoid that inevitable moment when his two worlds would collide. Tony did not meet his daughter for the first 18 months of her life, not face to face at least. He'd see her. He'd see her walking with her mother or with Tim Arnold, but, but he didn't meet her for 18 months. It was at that point in the spring before her death that Krista asked Tony to put Ava on his health insurance and she started talking about potentially wanting child support from him. This may seem unreasonable to some of you that she had told him she didn't need his help, that she was going to do it on her own. But honestly, I think if he'd made any effort in the first few days of Ava's life to make room for Ava and Krista in some way in his life, that she would have been content with that but he completely, literally vanished. So I think that a lot of it came from anger and a little bit of revenge. Both Krista and Tony knew that putting Ava on his health insurance was something that Susan would definitely find out about. So Krista told Tony, you have until Ava's second birthday to tell your wife. Tony still put it off for a little while. Susan went on a trip to Florida in March and without her physically there, he steeled himself to tell her the truth when she got back. He told their grown daughter, Bronwyn, possibly as a test run for when he had to face Susan. Bronwyn drove over to Krista's house. She wanted to meet her baby sister, Ava. I personally don't get the impression that any of Tony's kids hated or disliked or blamed Krista for what happened. Bronwyn and her husband, Keith Amato, at the time, they would often use Krista's outdoor shower if they were at the beach and they wanted to wash off before going home. I get the impression that they had a good, if fragile, relationship with Krista. When Susan got back and Tony had to tell her, it didn't go smoothly. Later, when he looked back on that moment, he said, quote, When I saw the anguish on her face, it was agonizing to me. I was so cruel to someone who didn't deserve it. She asked me, were there others? And I said, yes. Susan left her home and she drove to her father's and she told her father what happened with tears streaming down her face that Tony had been having an affair with Krista. They'd had a child together. She didn't know anything about it. And her father was like, oh, I thought something was actually wrong. That's it? Tony says it's over, so it's over. Move on with your life. And eventually, Susan did move on with her life in a big way. She told herself that Tony was a good man. People make mistakes. And she didn't want to walk around with that kind of anger inside of her. They had built a life together. They had a family. So she stood by her man. And more than that, she accepted both Ava and Krista into her life. She invited Krista and Ava over for dinner. Tony's whole family was there. Later, Susan would say that she willingly opened her doors to the woman who had slept with her husband and had his child. She said she enjoyed Krista's company. Now, here are my thoughts. Either Susan Jacket is the most saintly woman I have ever known, or she's exaggerating her acceptance of the situation. This isn't the ex-wife of your new boyfriend or your new husband. This is a woman who seduced your husband behind your back, who slept with him for many months when everybody else knew except for you, and who gave birth to his child that you didn't even know about until almost two years after this child was born. The amount of anger, betrayal, embarrassment, and shame that comes along with the knowledge of all of that, I don't think that those feelings are going to dissipate quickly. I don't think you're going to, at least right away, begin enjoying the company of the woman who slept with your husband. Now let me be clear, I don't necessarily think that Susan Jacket had anything to do with Krista's death. I think after Krista's death, Susan probably painted a rosier picture of their relationship 
for fear of being blamed for it or being a suspect. In interviews, she really didn't talk about Krista in the most glowing way. She said that night that Krista came over for dinner, that Krista apologized to her, but Susan didn't think it sounded very sincere. However, Susan did say that the whole family fell madly in love with Ava, and Krista allowed Susan and Tony to take Ava for short visits, only after making a promise that they would not tell the little girl that Tony was her father. Krista didn't want her to know yet. And Krista was still having issues with her father and his girlfriend, Beth Porter. Krista talked to a lawyer about having Toppy declared legally incompetent so she could basically manage his money and his finances and his affairs. And the lawyer was like, you don't really have any grounds for that. But Beth Porter caught wind that Krista was trying to interfere. And it was reported that she told a friend that Krista was trying to basically take away her cash cow. And in November of 2001, just a few months before her death, Krista changed her will, giving Amira Chase custody of Ava, if anything should happen to Krista. Now, was this some sort of weird premonition that something was about to happen to her? I don't believe so. I think that Krista was obviously, like I said, an anxious and paranoid person, always worried. With the death of her mother from colon cancer, Krista started to become worried that maybe she would get sick. She started going to the doctors and getting tests. She didn't want to leave Ava alone in the world without anybody to take care of her. And I don't think she wanted Susan and Tony to be the ones raising Ava if something were to happen to her. Over the holidays, she brought Ava back to New York City for a visit with friends. And she told some of these friends that she was thinking of bringing her daughter back to Manhattan to live. She was making plans for the future for herself, for her beloved daughter, for the both of them together. But that future would be short lived. Within a week after the ball dropped, bringing the world from 2001 to 2002, Krista Worthington would be gone. Okay, so that's the end of part one. We went over a lot, I think. We, we set a stage for the relationships in Krista's life. We got an idea of who Krista was and, you know, what she was all about. And like I said, I am waiting for some facts to be checked and clarified for me. Hopefully the Massachusetts State Police get back to me within the next couple of days so I can polish off my notes and record the next video for you guys. But I will get it up for you as soon as possible. Thank you so much for watching. I'm so glad to be back here. Now I realize that there's an echo and the sound's not great. I realized that right when I started recording because I'm in my new space that I'm going to be recording in from now on once I get it set up. Before I even finished recording this video, I went on Amazon and I bought some of those soundproofing panels to put up so that it, it dampens the sound in here and it doesn't sound echoey. So it won't ever sound like this again, guys. I'm so sorry. I had no idea that it would be this echoey. Thank you so much for watching. Stay kind and stay beautiful and I'll see you next time. Bye.